Hello everyone and welcome to part one of our two-part series, Tips and Tricks to Better Histology in Tissue-Based Research, a review of key factors influencing tissue preparation and processing. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Leica Biosystems. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their site at leicabiosystems.com. So let's get started. I wanna remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of your presentation window or report your problem by clicking on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. I now want to introduce our presenter, Fiona Tarbett, a product manager at Leica Biosystems in Melbourne, Australia. For a complete biography of our presenters, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Fiona, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Well, thank you for the introduction. So today I'd like to talk to you about um, just some different tips and tricks to better histology and better quality throughout the laboratory. So these are just a compilation of um, things that we have learned over the long journey. And hopefully you'll find this a very informative uh, couple of talks. So first with our disclaimer. This presentation does provide an educational um, material. This is not intended to be medical or regulatory or legal advice. So first of all, I'd like to set the scene. It's often really difficult as anybody who's working in a laboratory, whether it be clinical laboratory or in a research setting, to it, there's a lot of pressure today. There's often less time to think problems through when problems do occur. And often problems are not necessarily brought to your attention in a timely manner. So you may find that there is a problem long after the blocks are cut and the tissue has been stained. There's more pressure to react quickly and therefore quick fixes. And the staff might be inexperienced or not fully trained. Those interpreting the slides may not be the people that would actually understand some of the problems caused by incomplete fixation, excessive sized specimens or protocols that are too short. You're often expected to do more with less resources. There's an accelerating pace of technological change and monitoring, maintaining and improving quality under these circumstances is a major challenge. So you do need to be thinking both globally at a management level and locally at a bench level to identify the key factors affecting quality. So in simple terms, what we are trying to do every single day is produce high quality sections and stains in minimum time from blocks that cut easily and are stable on prolonged storage with accurate identification and labeling in minimum time and consistently every day. Simple, isn't it? So as a challenge, just think of six actions you would take to improve the quality in your laboratory. You can probably think of more than six. But what you can think about in terms of the actions are management actions and bench level actions. So the majority of this talk will be on a more technical level. So we'll be talking about bench level actions, but just to go through some of the management level actions to think about. There's staff recruitment, staff induction and training. There's staff accountability and traceability, who did what and when. Staff shift rostering to make it um, more interesting for people and also to rotate staff through. Staff task rostering, ongoing professional development, staff morale. Interaction of all staff with pathologists or senior scientists, selection of instruments and equipment, equipment maintenance, reagent quality and supply, lab layout, conditions and workflow. 
all critical. At a bench level, there are just so many different factors that do affect technical quality. As you can see from the graphic on the right hand side here, we've put together just so many different, um, different factors from all the different stages of your workflow. And these are probably just a few. There's probably a lot more that people can actually think of. So today's webinar will be concentrating on the pre-analytics and up to the processing. And the next webinar will be concentrating on the following process from embedding through to cover slipping. So first of all, Here's a quote from Bracegirdle, and this was sometime in the last century, but nothing has really changed in this aspect. If tissue is not in a healthy living state when it is fixed, it can only reveal abnormal details, whatever its subsequent treatment. So think about some of the prefixation um, damage where this could occur. Heat damage, where forceps or um, forceps or cautery happens and the tissue is left uh, burnt, if you like. So the morphology is lost, uh, tissue is shrunken. Desiccation. Often tissue does not get fixed in a timely manner. You're, sometimes you might find that the tissue is actually stuck to the lid of your container. Crush artifact. Tissue is treated a bit rough, roughly, and it is um, partially crushed. Autolysis. This can occur if fixation hasn't happened in a timely manner. So what can we do? We can document problem sources, particularly around cold ischemic time. That This is critical and is often missed. Get the word out. Education, training, information sheets where people have to actually list how long uh, the tissue is um, fixed for at the time when it was put into fixation, the role of the pathologist, internal and external communication, improve specimen transport if possible. Think about what the role of the lab is, how are tissues treated when they actually come into the lab. Are large tissues automatically um, opened and allowed to fix? What does the lab actually do? So fixation, some common problems, inappropriate containers, inadequate volume of formalin, poor quality fixative, or tissue fragments that are roughly handled. So think about um, the size of the container. You should be having a container that fits the specimen. You should, there is generally a rule of thumb of one in 20, certainly no less than one in 10 volume um, tissue to fixative. The fixative uh, pH is critically important to make sure that fixation actually happens correctly. Some of the consequences of inadequate fixation, there's nuclear evacuation. You might have a shrinkage and separation, particularly if the tissue has been fixed in alcohol. There's formalin pigment if um, the pH is incorrect, or zonal fixation where the tissue um, has not been penetrated accurately and therefore the external uh, part of the tissue might be fixed in a different way than the internal areas of the tissue. Again, some of the consequences that you might see on downstream processes. Uh, on the left, you can see a breast tissue where um, there is uneven staining due to zonal fixation. You can see a tonsil that has been stained for a capillite chain where well-fixed tissue is showing very strong, well-demarcated um, staining and poorly fixed and weak reaction on the right-hand side. Same tissue, just poorly fixed. Here we can see some of the differences that you would see if a tissue is correctly fixed in formalin or has had inadequate fixation in formalin and is fixed in ethanol. As you can see, there's quite a large amount of shrinkage, but it's actually, they look like different tissues. We have the ability and uh, many of these slides we have created internally. So we've used the same tissue, just cut in parallel 
one fixed in formalin and the other fixed in ethanol. And as you can see, there is a very big difference between that fixed in formalin and that fixed in ethanol. So what would make an ideal fixative? An ideal fixative should react rapidly and completely with tissue, fixing all the constituents without removing any of them. It would penetrate rap rapidly and deeply. Tissue would be stabilised to withstand all the chemicals that are used later in later processing. They should be minimally distorted by swelling or shrinkage, should be hardened sufficiently to make handling easy, and you should be able to perform a full range of staining methods, and that would include IHC or any molecular assays that are needed. Tissue should be left in fixative indefinitely without harm, and should be cheap, non-toxic, and non-inflammable. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as an ideal fixative. So a lot of um, what we need to do is a compromise, and formalin, uh, is the world's most common fix it, fixative. There are pros and cons to formalin. It is relatively stable. It is relatively cheap. It does favour basophilic staining. Most stains are possible, though obviously with IHC, anyone familiar with that will know that you do need to do antigen retrieval. The tissue consistency is okay. The tissue shrinkage is acceptable. Morphology is acceptable. And prolonged fixation is generally okay. But the cons are that it does penetrate slowly. It fixes slowly. It is unpleasant and it's toxic. Not as good results with acid dyes. It requires retrieval for IHC and ish. Uh, if it is left in an unbuffered state, you can get formalin pigment and it does require buffering. There are many commercial fixatives and commercial non-formalin fixatives on the market. It's always good to be aware of what the um, non-formalin fixatives are. Most, um, most people looking at tissue nowadays are very familiar with the artefacts that come with the formalin fixation. There may be differences with the different fixatives. So always uh, understand what the fixatives are, always understand too. There are some, for instance, that require uh, only up to seven days, um, that only last up to seven days. It might require refrigeration. So yes, just be very aware of the choice of fix fixative. So some of the fixation factors. So there's the rate of penetration and diffusion and the rate of reaction with formalin. So it's often described as the penetration reaction paradox. So while it does, uh, formalin does penetrate relatively rapidly, the actual fixation is quite slow. So first forming a methylene bridge reversible with the primary amines, and then more complex structures as fixation continues. And this is why, um, this is sort of the basis of antigen retrieval, where the initial reversible part of fixation allows us to retrieve tissue so that um, we can then uh, perform IHC. So more of in a clinical world, um, they do, there are more and more rules to try and standardise fixation. Obviously in research, this is an absolute opportunity to try and standardise because it is just so important. Fixation is continuous. Fixation is necessary to um, happen immediately. Um, if not immediately, need to understand just how long that time was between uh, when a tissue was removed from a living um, body and put into fixative. So again, in the clinical world, there are rules about between 6 and 72 hours, so limiting it on both the upper and lower ends. So just remember the basics. With fresh tissue, fix it as soon as possible. If fixation isn't possible, refrigerate, but don't freeze. Freezing can cause um, the, an artifact or ice crystal artifact. Fresh tissue may be infectious. Do not distort and label very carefully. So again, the basics, remember proper penetration 
Fixation, the fixative should penetrate from all sides. So make sure that your container allows for that. Make sure that your cassettes allow for that. The cavity should be opened if you have a large organ. Make sure that you do open um, before fixation or if it's come in, make sure that you inspect and open it just to allow the fixative to get in. Perfusion of some specimens could be advantageous. The thickness of the specimen is very important. Some agitation is useful just to move the fluid around and allow for um, diffusion. An adequate volume of fixative is vital. As I said earlier, one in 20 is a rule of thumb, um, certainly never less than one in 10. Sufficient time is required for penetration and fixation. Um, up to 24 hours, as you can see, the um, a six to 72 hours is given for breast tissues, uh, particularly if someone wants to do uh, an ER or PR, which is an IHC. But 24 hours, if you have 24 hours, is really considered ideal. Room temperature is satisfactory, but heat will increase penetration. But remember, excessive heat um, during fixation might also cause other, um, other metabolic reactions to occur. So it's a balance. 37 degrees would be perhaps sufficient for fixation um, heat. Again, the right choice of fixatives. Carefully made up from reagents and a suitable quality and at the correct pH. If you are making up your own um, fixative, it is really important to understand exactly what the proportions of the salts if you're using buffered or to realise what is going to happen if, it's an, if you're using an unbuffered um, formalin. Formalin is particularly susceptible to pH um, and as well as fixation. You do need that combination of the correct pH, 7 um, or slightly alkaline. And obviously fix, fixatives and are going to be so affected by the pH that um, if it is more acid, you will not only start becoming um, formic acid and therefore um, having those artifacts, but you would also, the, fix, the fixation reaction, the chemical reaction just won't occur. Many commercial formalin fixatives do contain up to 10% methanol. This is to stabilise them. Um, but again, remember that if the commercial fixative does contain a large amount of methanol, then the, ethyl, the will be the alcoholic um, fixative first and then the uh, formalin chemical reactions. So check specimens received in fixative and replace if necessary. If a specimen has been in a, fixa in a fixative or formalin fixative for too long, um, again, it starts to become ineffective as a fixative. So you do need to replace it. Use only one uh, for, for primary fixation. And if you do need to do a post-fixation step, um, then make sure that, again, it is appropriate for what you want to demonstrate later on. Fixatives are also toxic and irritant, so be careful. So moving on to grossing. So getting the message through, thick specimens will not be properly fixed. Thick specimens process poorly when normal routine schedules are used. So how do you enforce this? On the right, you can see some images. The most routine cassettes are only about five millimetres in depth. So you do need to um, cut the tissue quite thinly. And I believe in the US, it's often considered the size of a dime is appropriate. Also with larger tissues, I talked earlier about opening cavities. This is another, um, a large liver, I think, that we have actually, what we would call breadboarding. And that just means slicing at appropriate intervals, just so that the fixative can get in. You could really, you can also soak paper towels and put them within the, within the um, sections that you've set, cut and then sort of reform and reshape so that you don't distort the tissue, but you also ensure that you get adequate fixation. So think about some of the common problems. If a specimen is too thick or too large for a cassette, 
Because of the thickness, the specimens will not process using your standard schedule. In extreme cases, cassette bars will distort the specimen. And you can see here some um, extreme examples where a tissue um, on the left was actually uh, too large when it was put into the cassette and has now retained the outside um, or the, the bars of the cassette as it has shrunk, as it has fixed. Uh, the middle shows that tissue often is jammed into cassettes. If it doesn't fit in a cassette, and then it's not going to process correctly. Specimens shrink during processing. So the cassette choice must always allow for this. We saw in the previous slide where the specimen was too large for the cassette. Uh, equally, you must think about is the, is the tissue actually too small? Is it friable? Will it fall through the cassette? Make sure that the, the cassette choice is the correct choice. There's always a risk of specimen to specimen contamination if tissue actually um, if tissue actually comes through the holes in the cassettes. So we've also seen that for many different um, techniques, it is appropriate to use what we would call a mega cassette. So mega cassettes are, as you can see, there's an example where at least twice the size of a routine cassette. So this actually does um, create challenges for correct fixation, making sure that we do not treat a mega cassette or a tissue that fits in a mega cassette in the same way or fix for the same time. It will need longer fixation. Grossing, we need to make sure that we correctly gross so that it still fits within the large cassette. And again, particularly as there is so much material that it isn't crammed in. And for processing and cutting, we may need new microtomes, we may need new equipment. So moving on to the next stage, our tissue processing. So what to look for when assessing and monitoring processing quality? There's a theoretical approach to optimise processing. Advantages of batch processing based on specimen type and dimensions, the causes of poor processing quality, and getting the best results from your tissue processor. So what are the effects of poor processing? So first of all, there is the macro effects, where the tissue has an unusual physical properties at embedding. Section preparation may be difficult and blocks might deteriorate rapidly. Then there's the micro effects, which is the physical quality of the section is poor, the tissue morphology is poor, or the staining quality is poor. So just going through some of the effects of poor processing. You might see this demonstrated um, by the time you cut your tissue. And as you can see there, uh, the tissue has not been processed correctly, leaving a large hole in the centre. It might still look in its native state, but obviously once you start to section it, there is nothing actually on, you are unable to actually section and you lose the tissue. You might see some damage, like large cracks, which again are shown on that slide on the right as uh, cracked and lost tissue. Here we can see some examples of poor processing. Not always what you might expect. This is a tissue that has been inadequately um, in the tissue has been too large for the processing protocol that we saw. So on the outside, we can see that there is um, that the tissue processing has been reasonable. But as we move further into the tissue, we can see the gross cracking um, because the tissue has not been supported. And then in the very centre of this tissue, we can see that there is still remains some water in the tissue. So that we have a number of different effects in this tissue where uh, the processing protocol was not long enough to penetrate, um, to allow the reagents to penetrate in to remove the water, but then also left sort of alcohol within the tissue um, and caused drying and cracking. So what you might see is 
when you're preparing your section that the block has poor texture, that it's not uniform, it's not cohesive, the sections might compress or the ribboning might be poor. Again, this is not um, the microtome, this is the processing. You might see when you are flushing out your tissue that the sections sweat on the water bath, the components separate on the water bath or that the sections are impossible to flatten. You may also see that the block stability um, reduces on storage so that the specimens start to shrink in the block or the block uh, contains opaque patches, which means that there's still some residue solvent left in the block. We talked about the micro effects. So phys physical quality of the sections. You may see that the sections are disrupted, that they adhere poorly to the slides, that they're cracked or that they're uneven in thickness. The quality of tissue preservation. Sections can show poor nuclear detail. They might show poor cytoplasmic detail. Some special tissue features can be disrupted. Fibrous elements, poorly preserved or well, preservation is not uniform throughout the specimen. Or the quality of staining. So the staining may not be uniform. Nuclear staining can be poor. We can see in this example, the, there is still water left in this um, section and the nuclear staining is almost completely disappeared. You're just seeing what we would describe as a blue hue. The cytoplasmic staining could be poor as it may have an effect with um, alcohol or again in this instance here we can see that there is still a bit of water left in that tissue affecting the cytoplasmic stain as well or that the extracellular components are poorly demonstrated. So all of these could be effects um, in different ways and it is a way of assessing your tissue to have a look at the different aspects from physical quality, from the quality of the morphology, but also the staining. You may have poor staining because you have poor staining, but often staining is an effect of the poor processing as well. So really consider what is causing any sort of artifacts you see. So as a theoretical approach to optimise processing, you really need to think about, um, do you need to separate out your tissues? You may have small tissues that don't require long processing protocols um, or that your processing protocol that you have or the instrumentation that you have is has a slightly higher ambient temperature and therefore your protocol um, might be optimally um, shorter for smaller tissues or little friable tissues. You may also have um, medium-sized tissues, which is sort of optimally processed, say, at around four to six hours. But then you may have large tissues. So how do they process? I mean, the larger the tissue, the more time you need to penetrate into those tissues. You might have more dense tissues, uh, more fatty tissues. So you really need to think about what is the... what your tissue type is, and if you can separate out or optimise the processing uh, for these tissues, it is always a good idea. So here's just some examples where we might consider one to two hours for a two millimetre endoscopy biopsy, uh, a slightly longer time for myocardium. We might see a wedge of cervix, um, which is quite dense, um, hard tissue and often a uh, larger section might be taken and that would require a longer time. So there's sort of a minimal acceptable quality. Um, if you do need to put all of your tissues in together, just be aware of where that line might be. So to optimise processing quality, you could process tissues in batch based on specimen types and dimensions. The challenge is always to do that with um, the, number of, the number of instruments you have to process tissues as well as maintaining an effective workflow. So think about what instrument uh, choice you're having to satisfy demands. Think about the workflow of your laboratory and whether you can actually optimise the workflow to fit in with the needs of your specimens to optimise the tissue processing quality. 
So another challenge. So think of listing 12 different causes of poor quality processing. Probably you could think of, again of a lot more. So here is just some that we prepared earlier. And as you can see, it is a can of worms. There's incorrect solvent, there's a specimen type, there might be incorrect fixation, there might be faulty dehydration, poor clearing, poor grossing, underfiltration, under infiltration, processor malfunction, processes not maintained properly, poor quality reagent, inappropriate cassettes, excessive specimen load, scheduled too long, scheduled too short. There might be calcium in the tissue or the temperature isn't correct. So, and these are just some. If the tissue isn't fixed before processing, as we went through some of the um, reasons for the fixation, um, you can see the effect of short fixation, then the processing will not be, will not be good. The specimens are too thick, poor grossing techniques or tissue that no one can decide on um, which part not to put in, so they put in the whole lot into a cassette. The tissue is too dense for that particular protocol. It's too fatty and it, um, again, needed a special protocol to deal with the fat. Tissue contains calcium deposits um, or foreign bodies such as sutures or staples or synthetic grafts. Always best to remove it grossing before we get to the microtome site. The schedule was too short, so specimens were not properly fixed or not properly dehydrated, not properly cleared, not fully infiltrated with wax or a combination of all of the above. The schedule was too long. So tiny or delicate specimens were exposed to dehydrants for too long or exposed to a higher concentration of dehydrants too soon. And this is particularly important uh, when you have um, poorly fixed tissue. As you saw earlier in the presentation, if the tissue is fixed in ethanol rather than formalin, it causes a great deal of shrinkage and really a completely different picture. You could be exposed to clearing agents for too long, exposed to hot wax for too long, high temperatures for too long, or a combination of all of the above. So really think about the proportions of your uh, protocol, not just um, having using any one size fits all protocol. It's really important to think about every aspect. As I said, with the incorrectly proportioned for the specimen type, you may have the insufficient dehydration, excessive dehydration before clearing, insufficient clearing before wax, insufficient time in wax, excessive time in wax. And remember that the time in wax um, is also not just when the protocol finishes, but when you actually remove the tissue from your tissue processor. You may uh, process overnight, having an end time at six or seven in the morning, and then the tissue is not retrieved from the tissue processor till nine. That is all extra time in wax that by definition is still heated. So remember to think about that when you're thinking about your tissue processing protocols. There could also be a problem with loading a processor. The wrong schedule is actually chosen. How do people know which is the correct protocol? Make sure your protocols are named very clearly. The baskets may be overloaded with cassettes the cassettes overloaded with tissue or inappropriate cassettes used. Uh, you saw earlier that there are different cassettes. Some will be mesh, some will have larger holes. Think about your choice of cassette. Uh, must support the tissue, but you may use other things like papers or biopsy pads and keep the same cassettes just so that you get consistent um, movement of fluid. There may be maintenance issues with your instrument. Instruments, every instrument will need to be maintained well. So make sure that the maintenance is kept up. Also make sure that uh, we always use a correct reagent. 
that when you do replace the solvents, if you're taking them out manually, that they go back in in the right place. Be careful of heavily contaminated reagents. Using recycled reagents of unsatisfactory quality, recyclers will give um, recommendations on how how pure the final product will be. So just remember most um, recycling of alcohols, the recyclers themselves would um, say that their product at the end is perhaps 98% pure. Um, remember that uh, if you are using as 100% that you um, take that into consideration that you will now have 2% and then maybe more of um, water in your final product. Some people do make a mistake and purge to start the cleaning cycle before they've moved this, removed the specimens. While never ideal, um, they can be recovered, but just really make sure that there are adequate processes within your laboratory so that this doesn't happen. Inadequate training of staff. Often the people doing the changing the tissue processes are not well trained on just how critical the tissue processing is to to the overall workflow. So make sure that they know how important their job is. There's also a lot of different factors that affect um, carryover during processing. And again, this is the calculation whether your instrument actually does calculate um, correctly what the concentration of reagents are, or whether you are changing reagents based on a time of the week or the time somebody can actually come in to do the change or on the number of cassettes. But just remember there are a number of different factors that will actually affect the reagent carryover. So there is the number, the type, size of the specimens themselves, the number and type of cassettes, uh, cassettes that have got um, more infrastructure, if you like, uh, might actually carry over more reagent to the next, to the following reagent than a cassette a more standard cassette. The drain time between the steps can be important. The actual retort design. Reagent viscosity, if you are using a xylene substitute, uh, some of these may be more viscous than xylene. So remember that in considering uh, the carryover of, into the wax. The reagent volume. The properties of the previous reagent, if you have a lot of graded alcohols or if you are having a format with fewer graded alcohols, uh, remember that you will be carrying over from the previous reagent. Reagent temperature is important. Basket design, does your basket allow you to um, stack uh, your cassettes in too tightly or have you got springs which actually allows for more um, fluid movement? The number of biopsy pads and the type of biopsy pads. So biopsy pads, uh, while very efficient at holding small tissues in place, actually do carry over at least 10 times the amount of reagent as a standard cassette. So remember if there's a lot of biopsy pads that your, um, your reagents will be coming more contaminated than you perhaps are expecting. Miscellaneous. So a failure to fill, maybe specimens are left in the air for a prolonged period, allowing drying to occur. To occur. Um, maybe the specimen's being immersed in particular reagent for an excessive time, such as wax, when they're not removed at the end of the run. Specimens being subjected to excessive heat, could that be at the embedding centre? Specimens being placed in contaminated reagents, such as wax contaminated with formalin, Think about where you place your, um, your basket that contains formalin. Does that sit on top of the tissue processor, dripping formalin into the wax? It's important to think about these things. Specimens can sometimes be lost during processing if the cassettes were not correct. So that's a total of 36 causes. I'm sure there's more. So as there's so many different possible causes, so what do you do? Um, to analyse your problem. So when faced with blocks that are difficult to section, the first question to ask is, what was different about that run that produced problem specimens to the previous successful runs? If you've been using the same protocol for the same types of tissues for a long time, then it 
probably not the protocol. Was the intended schedule or protocol actually used? Does my problem affect all the specimens in a batch or just a small number? Are they all of a similar type? Are they all from the same source? Were my specimens at the very top of the retort? Do I know with certainty what has gone wrong? Often assumptions are made about what might have gone wrong or where the problem may be. Um, really ask, do I know? Were my specimens processed using the usual schedule that generally produces good results for this type of specimen? Is it likely that the schedule was too long or too short for my problem specimens? Do I definitely know that the problem was caused by the processor malfunction? Did the software indicate any error? Did a visual check of reagent bottles help? The levels? Is there a possibility that an error has been made when replacing solvents on the processor? Or were any reagents over their recommended purity thresholds? Was normal fixation applied to my problem specimens? So all of these questions acting as a checklist can really help you determine what was wrong, what has gone wrong. And if you remain uncertain as to the cause of the problems, just gather as much information as you can by examining your specimens, thinking about different possible causes and thinking about the situation as well. So close examination of the blocks can confirm what you suspect may have happened and your nose can help if there's still solvent left in the tissue. It can often help to describe your blocks too. So we often use words um, which like crisp or crunchy or brittle. It's often better to be much more descriptive, um, really think about your macro effects, really think about your micro effects, Think about the terms you're using to describe the tissue. Is it um, is there autolysis or um, you know have you lost morphology? What is the what does the nuclei actually look like? So, but we do use terms like crisp, crunchy, brittle, shrunken, shriveled, cooked. So some of the reasons for this might be it could be overprocessed, could be underprocessed, um, sludgy, could be underprocessed with fat overprocessed, dry, powdery, if there's hard fragments, is it calcium or other material? Smells of clearing reagent, probably underprocessed, soft and compressible, underprocessed. So reprocessing can be done, but we really need to be careful about how you reprocess. Because remember you're coming from a situation where your tissue is not in a perfect condition anymore. So if it's overprocessed, reprocessing will probably not help. If it's underprocessed, you can carefully consider what you need to do in order to um, proceed. And there are different there are different um, methods to reprocess, some of which might be more suitable for others, depending on what has happened to your tissue. Is the outer rim satisfactory but the center is poor? You saw an earlier example, it's probably underprocessed. Is there poor consistency, poor consistency throughout? Maybe there's a problem with your processing reagents or the fix, fixation. Is the outer rim brittle but the center is satisfactory? Overprocessing. There may be discrete layers or areas that are poor. There could be underprocessing of susceptible tissues. You may have a tissue that has got soft elements and then quite dense um, collagen. Perhaps there is one where you needed to consider the different type of tissue and you know perhaps use a, a medium length tissue processing protocol. Specimen separated from surrounding wax. It, could it be an embedding fault or is it underprocessing? So as a final question, optimising processing. We can look at these two examples. Um, both are processed on an eight-hour schedule. One is kidney block A and one is kidney block B. 
But I will tell you that it is exactly the same tissue. It is cut in parallel. So it's the same source, it's the same kidney. It's cut in parallel. They'll both put on an eight hour schedule. So think of the different steps that we just went through in what do I know? What do I know and how would I um, understand what has actually happened to this tissue? Why is there such a difference between a really well processed um, kidney in block A and a pretty poor um, tissue in block B? So think about what your answer will be. What is the difference between these two tissues? But I'll go to the next slide and let you know. The difference was the block on the left is three millimetres in thickness and the block on the right was 4.5 millimetres in thickness. This is enough to change the appearance of this tissue um, and to change the processing. So again, if everybody got that completely correct, then well done. But it is really worth thinking and challenging your suppositions of what may go wrong during processing. So that's the end of this session. Um, the next session will be continuing on um, from embedding to, cover, to um, handing out the slides. Um, and we will be taking questions at the end of the next session. So thank you very much for your attention today. I hope that it was informative and any questions, let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, for that informative presentation. Questions that come in during today's broadcast will be answered during part two of our webinar series airing on Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific and 12 p.m. Eastern time. We want to thank you again, Fiona, for your time today and for your important research. We also want to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Leica Biosystems, for underwriting today's educational webcast. You can view the webinar on demand, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and we look forward to seeing you on Thursday for part two, Tips and Tricks to Better Histology in Tissue-Based Research, a review of key factors influencing the quality of sections and stains. Take care, everyone. Be safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.